Hi everybody, welcome to your bird video notes. Joining us today we have two little special friends, Checkers over here and Copper over there. We'll get to them more in a little bit. So as we start, we first need to talk about some major characteristics of birds. So a lot of these I'm sure you're very aware of. Birds have wings, they have feathers, they have these lightened bones with all these air spaces in them. And then they also have a very high metabolic rate. And this is something we'll talk about a little more when we get to digestion, but it's very important for them to be capable of flight. Before we get into modern birds, we need to talk about Archaeopteryx. So this is a really important species in that it's the transition from dinosaurs to modern birds. And I also need to point out that birds and reptiles are essentially the same as has been recently determined by scientists. It's really just a matter of non-feathered reptiles and feathered reptiles. So this particular species had some similarities to dinosaurs, yes but also has some behavioral characteristics that are similar to birds. So it was capable of flight, not quite sure the, the ability of that per se, but it's similar in that modern birds also fly. So when we talk about evolution of flight, we first start with birds that jumped from branch to branch. Then they began moving from branch to ground. Eventually gliding evolved then some weak flapping kind of joined in with that to where eventually wing-powered flight. Now, remember, this is over hundreds and thousands of years. However, it's a more simpler way of breaking down this process. So in terms of flight, everything about birds is essentially pressured evolutionary on the ability to fly or not. So the feathers, the senses, the bones, all of those adaptations are what makes birds capable of flight today. So that being said, the bird skeleton has some important structures that we really haven't seen so far. And there's four main things that we're going to focus on for these major structures. So the, syn the synsacrum, the pigostyle, the sternum, and the furcula. And we're going to go through each of those on this diagram over here. So the synsacrum is this bone kind of on the back, and it helps flight posture, but also helps during landing. The pigostyle is kind of the end, it's kind of a tail, sort of, but it helps steer during flight, and there's usually feathers attached to this. The sternum is going to be this, oh, my thing doesn't want to show up, this large bone structure here, which helps with flight muscle attachment. And then lastly, we have the furcula, which is the wishbone. So many of you maybe fought over this with your siblings, Thanksgiving dinner, but the wishbone also helps with flight muscle attachment. So speaking of muscles, right? So breast muscles are really important for flight. And it's important to note that domestic birds are bred for their flight muscles. So that helps. Obviously, they can't fly now because their flight muscles are so large that it's not possible, but they were bred for this. And these are the largest muscles in a bird. Another structure I do want to point out is a perching tendon. And this is along kind of the back ankle of the bone of the foot. And it helps so when they come down and grip, that joint flexes and they're able to attach to tree branches. All right, so the digestive system is definitely something that's pretty unique to birds. So they have a very high metabolic rate. Therefore, they are always eating. Birds are always eating. It comes in one end and out the other. And they're always pooping before they fly, while they fly, when they land. Because the point is they need to keep their body as light as possible. So they have two main thing, structures that we're going to talk about. So they have a crop, and this is where food storage is located. And then they also have a two-region stomach. But the ventriculus, or the gizzard, is another really important structure. And this helps kind of crush and break down what they're eating. In fact, birds often swallow sand and rocks and things like that to help with digestion. Now, side note, there can be some problems if they get too much. Ask me about my um, crop surgery story with my chicken. Um, and also you see it in seabirds with plastic. So if their crops are too full of these abrasives or pollution or things like that, they ultimately starve to death as a result. All right, so on to circulation. So we are now in a class where all of the organisms have four chambers. So if you remember in reptiles, most of them had three except for crocodiles. So now birds were in those two complete atria and two complete ventricles. This also helps with that very rapid heart rate that birds have and that blood flow they need to help support their high metabolism. 
In terms of gas exchange, birds consume more oxygen than any other vertebrate, and they have to continuously move this oxygen throughout their body. But as a result, this is why birds can fly at such high altitudes with low oxygen, because they're always moving oxygen over their body, so their body's always retrieving some form of it from the atmosphere. Vision is the most important sense to birds. So we've talked about things like smell and hearing and vision and other organs being important, but in birds, it's vision. Vision is the most important, but it's also the most well-developed. So their eyes contain rods and cones, and rods are best, better for low light situations while cones are more during high light. And they also have search fovea and pursuit fovea. So this helps them to see both binocular vision they can see wide angle monocular vision, and also they have really good depth perception. And this is especially important for things like hawks and things like that that are trying to swoop down and attack their prey. They need to have, they need to have this ability to do so. They also have a nictating membrane, which helps cleans and just protect their eye. And you can see that in this structure up here, covering the eye. All right, so hearing is also important, but smell or olfaction is really not that important to birds. So turkey vultures, though, are the exception, which you see in this picture here, because they hunt dead animals. That's what they eat on, they're scavengers. So they wanna smell that, and that's how they find their prey. But in most other birds, they really don't have a good sense of smell. So they do have, though, well-developed hearing, which is very similar to human hearing. And they have these little feathers that cover their ears. In this picture here, the feathers are actually spread apart, so you can see that opening. But typically, when you look at a bird, you would never even see this opening because there's these feathers or auriculars that cover it. All right, so in terms of excretion, so we've already talked about the fact that birds poop a lot, right? So they also have uric acid, just like reptiles, and they have a cloaca, which helps them release this, also just like reptiles. Birds lay their eggs and excrete their waste all through their cloaca. Some marine birds also have salt glands, which is just like reptiles. So remember we talked about marine reptiles that have salt glands. Marine birds also have this structure and it just helps get rid of excess salt that may be in their bodies. In terms of thermoregulation, this is the first time we're talking about a truly endothermic organism that can keep their body temperature. So birds, as a result, maintain a body temperature between 38 and 45 degrees Celsius. They do some other things when they're particularly cold, which you notice in this picture of this pigeon here. So they'll fluff their feathers out. They'll look super puffy. They'll tuck their bills down to their neck. And they also can shiver to help keep warm. All right, so we've talked about all of these things, but we haven't quite talked about the thing that really sets birds apart from everybody else, and that's feathers. So they are covered in feathers, and this is known as plumage. And these develop very similar to reptile scales. If you remember earlier on in this video, I talked about how essentially birds and reptiles are really just non-feathered and feathered reptiles. So the primary functions of feathers is for flight, of course. They form flight surfaces. Now, obviously there are flightless birds that have evolved, so they can't use their feathers to fly, but it's very important for the majority of birds. And it's also important to prevent excessive heat loss. So feathers are like their insulation, and we'll talk about feather types in a minute because downy feathers are really important. These are the ones that really keep them warm. But feathers also have some secondary functions, right? So courtship, a lot of males have very elaborate feather displays. Think about a male peacock that fans his big tail feathers to help impress the females. They help incubate their eggs and then also waterproofing. So you'll see birds out in the rain and their feathers keep them from getting completely soaking wet because they do have some sort of waterproofing. And the color itself is just a positive during formation. And you also see a lot of iridescence and things like that in bird feathers. So structure and maintenance is really important to birds. They spend a lot of time taking care of their feathers. So they do something called preening, which you see up here in this picture, you see a mother hen and her baby both preening. So they help keep their feathers and smooth them in place. Birds also have a uropygial gland, which is right at the base of their tail, and it has this like oily secretion that they put their beak there and then they rub it all over their other feathers to keep their other feathers water repellent. 
Well, just like keeping feathers is important, they also need to keep them looking nice and keeping their body warm. So as a result, they molt. And this is similar to shedding, ecdysis, all those other terms we've used, except molting refers directly to losing feathers. And birds will typically molt twice. They'll molt right before breeding season, so they have these beautiful feathers when it comes time to find a mate. And they also, they also molt after mating. So there's three major types of feathers that we're going to talk about as well. So we have contour feathers, down feathers, and flight feathers. So flight feathers, down feathers, you've probably heard of. Down feathers are what's in like, you know, a goose down jacket, for example. And then flight feathers are obviously used for flight. But contour feathers are those other body feathers that kind of cover the body and they help keep the bird aerodynamic. In terms of flight mechanics, the bird's wing acts as an airfoil, so it helps move by lifting as the currents move over it. Birds also have something called an alula, which is at the very tip of their feather, and that helps reduce turbulence. Their tail also helps to steer, and they are there are four types of flight. So there's gliding, which is the most common. Oopsie. On my keyboard. Gliding, which is the most common, and then there's flapping used by waterfowl, soaring, and then hovering. So birds also migrate. They migrate annually, specifically from breeding to non-breeding areas. So this helps them avoid temperature extremes while still getting the food and shelter they need. The photo period is their typical migratory cue. And then they also use two different types of migration. They can either use landmarks or they use magnetic fields or the sun's compass. In terms of reproduction, all birds are oviparous, so they establish territories prior to mating and then they defend them, and they transfer sperm via cloacal contact, which you see in this picture right here. The male typically gets on top of the female and then puts his sperm in her cloaca. Females, though, only have one developed ovary, and that's the left side. And then it's important to note, too, that there are many different mating types. So birds can either be monogamous, which is the male and female, polygamous with one male and multiple females, or polyandrous where a female mates with multiple males. Bird songs are also super important. So birds have this structure called a syrinx, and it's the special voice box that helps them make their songs, specifically males, to attract females. And they can also use it to defend a territory, attract a mate, as we said, but even courtship duets, and just generally communicate. And here's just a couple examples I'll post this. All right, so in terms of nest development, so this is usually initiated by the female after she's formed her pair, and the female lays something called a clutch of eggs. And those eggs are incubated depending on the species, but she also rolls them during incubation to make sure they're evenly heated. Baby birds are two different types, so I'm sure at some point everyone has seen maybe a nest, a robin's nest, or something like that. Those are called altricial young, and those are over here. They are naked at hatching, they can't see, and they're entirely dependent on their parents, while precocial young, like the little guys that were just joining me, are very alert, and they're lively, and they can run and walk, and they're covered in feathers. Their parents do still have to show them, though, how to eat and drink and things. Imprinting is also something really cool that baby birds do, and it essentially helps make sure that they always know who their mother is. So they usually imprint on the first moving thing they see, which then becomes its mom. Although sometimes, like we see here, something like a duckling may imprint on a dog and think it's its mom. In terms of parental care, most of your precocial young do synchronous hatching because the moms want to leave the nest with all of their babies hatched at the same time. You don't often see this in altricial young though. And altricial young do have this other really cool structure called a gape mark, which helps induce their parents to feed them. They do leave the nest fully feathered two weeks after, two weeks after hatching, but they still get fed by the parents. And brood parasitism is something that is fairly common, but the European cuckoo is probably the most well known. And they lay their eggs after they kick out some of the mom's eggs. And then the mom ends up raising the cuckoo, which is like quadruple her size. In terms of class diversity, there's lots of orders of birds, but we're just going to focus on four local ones you may have seen. So Anseriformes are your waterfall, Exciptripiformes are your hawks, eagles, and vultures, Strigiformes are your owls, and then Passeriformes are like your songbirds, your swallows, and then also crows and larks. 
And then real quick, I'm just going to show you two final slides I'd like you to stop and read. The first is on the poultry industry, specifically in Georgia. And then the second is on pollution with birds. So make sure you pause it on the poultry slide and then pause it on the pollution slide.